Hello everyone, Rising Rising here. Five years ago today, on February 1st, 2015, Monty Ohm lost his life following a coma from an allergic reaction to a routine medical procedure. And now that Ruby and Rooster Teeth and the community and the world at large, now that we are five years on, I wanted to take some time to highlight his legacy and remember and honor him for who he was and all he's done. And it's a lot more than you might think. For the video, I will share a brief summary of his life, followed by a handful of select online posts of his that, put together, really get into the essence of who he was. Monty Ohm was born in Providence, Rhode Island on June 22, 1981, to a family of Asian immigrants, specifically being Cambodian, Vietnamese, Chinese, and Japanese. Through his life, he started out working at cafes, and he worked the third shift at a Kinko's in Providence, and moved to Chicago to work at Midway Games, then Santa Clara for Bandai Namco, and finally Austin for Rooster Teeth. He talked of working two jobs at a time, and there was even a point in his life where he moved to New York to try to become an actor. Poser, when I moved to New York and tried to become an actor. He was very allergic to cats. He was a hell of a dancer. And he started animating when he was 14 because the computer lab at his high school had Poser 2 on it. He copied it onto two zip disks and brought it home with him. Ruby, for context, was first animated on Poser 10. He was not the best pupil in school, instead being hyper-focused on animation in the bare-bones animation software available to him before he dropped out. He made several animations that either never went anywhere or never saw the light of day, but yet that he was proud of eventually when he'd done enough of it that he could make something good. Monty had spent the better part of a year on a project, and then nobody watched it because it was an original IP. That project and others like it led him eventually to a breakout success called Haloid because people would watch a Spartan from Halo and Samus from Metroid fighting each other. Rooster Teeth noticed him around the time of Red vs. Blue Season 5, but when Bernie and others called him to offer a job working on Red vs. Blue, Monty didn't realize that's what they were doing, and he ended the phone call before Bernie could get that out. Instead of potentially going to Rooster Teeth, Monty moved to Chicago to be a combat designer at Midway Games for a year. We can't really know what he was working on because that project never saw the light of day and never even had a name before it was canned. After that, the art director at Bandai Namco contacted him and he went on to work for them on Afro Samurai, a video game based on the manga series which released in 2009. During all of this, he was making his own bonkers fight scenes. On the car rides to and from Midway, Monty would listen to music and imagine, oh, if this is the music of a fight scene, a kick would match with this beat and it would be like this. That was the Dead Fantasy series. Eventually, the video game development process proved tiresome for Monty because it started out as fulfilling a creative vision, but quickly became, quote, four years of making sure it, the game, didn't break. From that, he knew staying in the film industry was much more worth his creative time. Afro Samurai finished production, and worlds collided once again. Because Bernie had Gavin Free direct Red vs. Blue Season 7, he had the time to go to Comic-Con that year. He was invited to be on a panel, and he saw Monty's name on the list. He knew he had to go and talk to him. Monty, meanwhile, had just finished being at Anime Expo, showing his animation, and he'd heard of Comic-Con, but he didn't have much interest in going. Then, he was invited to be on a panel, and he saw Bernie's name on the list in that email, and he knew he had to go. Yet, Monty and Bernie didn't really get as much of a chance to talk on the panel as they liked, so they decided to go for coffee together afterward. And Bernie said he lamented not being able to hire Monty on that phone call, and Monty said, I was like, you were trying to hire me? I, was just, <laughs> I thought we were just talking. And they hit it off. Bernie hired Monty in secret to work on Season 8 of Red vs. Blue, though technically he helped with some of the shots at the end of Season 7. Many months later, at the very first PAX East, the world saw a warthog break through a wall, and there was no going back. Monty was the first animator at Rooster Teeth, working on what before used to entirely be machinima. Rooster Teeth hired more animation talent for future seasons of Red vs. Blue, who worked alongside Monty through season 10. And that's when Bernie told him, I remember sitting down with you going, Monty, you can animate Red vs. Blue for the rest of the run of, the season, of this series. We can just keep doing this, but that's just eventually you're just going to hate it. You're just going to burn out. Is there anything, Monty, if anybody can make a show 
new show. We think it's you. Is there anything that you want to oh, do? Oh, it looks like the gates of hell are where you buy your guns. Oh, let's do that. I'll buy some guns. <laughs> but at, you know, at the time of finishing RVB season 10, like we were about like three months from finish, I just kind of started coming up with this idea of another show. And so I kind of... I, I've, I had some standing R and I'd been tinkering with from previous years, as well as just what I hit. What I hit was a was a <clears throat> essentially a name, uh, like kind of like a, a, a theme to go by, which was the colors, which <laughs> it's nothing new for us. You know, go from re- re- going from red versus blue to red, white, black, yellow. So Bernie said yes, and he worked on the entire red trailer with the help of friend Jeff Williams for music and nobody else. The red trailer is three and a half minutes long, but at one point it was about five. It was cut for time to fit the flow of the song that Jeff Williams had made. While making these color trailers, on day two, Monty enlisted Miles and Carrie, building its world and its characters and the hopes and the map. Monty knew he could choreograph and animate fights, but he also knew he needed Miles and Carrie on board to write the story that would make the fight choreography matter. Because while he had so many ideas, getting them into one story that flowed well was not really Monty's strong suit. This was Ruby Volume 1's production staff. This was not Rooster Teeth animation. That didn't exist yet. Many of these folk were contracted to work one production cycle, and then they left and came back when Volume 2 needed them. In these times, Monty Ohm was the picture of a workaholic, and he valued efficiency above all. This was his daily schedule at Rooster Teeth. Wake up, go to work, stay there the entire day, come home, shower, sleep, and repeat. There were days where he was so engrossed in his work that he only ate coffee. But he was a man of efficiency, so that's what he wanted. He'd rip out keys on his keyboard that set him back in work. He'd stick with the same version of his animation software with the same hotkeys for this or that, just so he knew how everything worked and he could do it as fast as possible until it was utterly impossible to keep that software on work computers. And even when he was away at conventions, he brought a bare-bones setup with him and he worked on what he could in the hotel room. And when his mother died, he questioned if he should even go to the funeral to see her and the other family that he hadn't seen in years, or not go, and honor her with his work. He did go, but he genuinely felt the other was just as honorable, because he understood his mother, and how similar the two of them were, being workaholics at heart. On March 10th, 2014, he married Sheena, and he lived with her, and at some point he made friends with a stray cat that they named Noodle. And then, on February 1st, 2015, before the couple's first anniversary, Monty died and Ruby's production for Volume 3 was halted. Whereas Volumes 1 and 2 premiered in the late July of their years, Volume 3 premiered on October 24th, 2015, around which all future volumes would also air. After his death, the crew addressed that Ruby would not be the same without Monty. They knew, they knew he had a knack for fight choreography and that they probably couldn't match up to it in some respects, not even considering that he had plans that never saw the light of day like an upgrade to Blake's weapon that would come sometime after the fall of Beacon, but never did, even when the plot offered a good moment for such an upgrade. However, Monty did have an idea for the Maidens sometime in between Volumes 2 and 3, right before he died, and Miles and Carrie honored that and wrote it into the show. Rooster Teeth Animation, as a department with full-time staff, began after Monty's death. You might think that none of Monty's animation made it into Volume 3, but he was able to work on some of the Yang and Mercury fight, as well as other animations before he passed. But only the Yang and Mercury fight animation made it into Volume 3, and even then it wasn't the entire fight. Ruby has grown to an international sensation with an official Japanese dub. The Ruby Volume 5 ad campaign as well, that Rooster Teeth put out to drive people to sign up for first memberships, was the most successful one that year. Or so Jeff Ramsey said in one of the many off-topic podcasts that has since blended together in my head. He said it because Achievement Hunter, one of their shows, was second only to Ruby. I know that I will never know Monty Alm but he lives on in the hours of live action and animated content at Rooster Teeth, as well as through his own writing that you can still find everywhere on the web. So for the rest of the video, I'm going to share a collection of Monty's posts from all across the internet. Sometimes he seems like how the Ruby After the Fall novel talks about Professor Ozpin, someone who talks like he means much more than he says out loud. Other times, he's honestly rather silly because Twitter used to be seen as an online diary of sorts, except everyone could see it. 
So you get a lot of this. I've already referenced content from his blog in this video, montyolm.net, which isn't live anymore because the domain expired, but you can still find it through a search on archive.org. There are two links to it in the description because he took it down at one point due to spam and junk mail. So one link is to the complete initial blog, and the second is to the complete second one. Here are some of the snippets of the most impactful, most telling passages to who Monty was, and I do implore you to check the links below in your free time to read through all of his thoughts. So first, if you didn't know, now you know, the blog is where the indomitable quote comes from. For the most part, many people know this quote. It's the one most often attributed to Monty if anyone does bring up a quote of his, besides, well, keep moving forward, of course. I won't read this one aloud, but I will note that the word resolve made its way from here into Jeff Williams' song Cold from the Ruby Volume 3 original soundtrack, and of course the rest of the quote lends to Indomitable from the Volume 6 original soundtrack. And speaking about his work schedule as I referenced earlier, he also said this, I find it laughable in conversations when other people equate their ground to mine when they say, yeah, I'm busy too, everyone's busy. No, I am busy. I am quite literally at my desk whenever I am not sleeping or in the shower. If you are not a complete prisoner of yourself, you are not my kind of busy. Getting away from work pretty much equates to paralysis. I simply don't know what to do with myself when I'm away. So he wrote this blog post, Passing, to share his thoughts from his mother's passing. He words it as if his mother passed on his 31st birthday without actually directly stating that. So it may or may not have been the same day versus just one close to it. The following quotes on screen are his response to how his family talked of her. Monty empathized with his mother in a way only describable as sharing a profound understanding of the human experience and what it all means. That if you work hard enough, your effort and your creation, whatever that might be, transcends your death and therefore life is not futile because of this he smiled so quickly that it was odd to those around him but he knew her and he knew himself and he knew two souls who existed to create because there was no other option as for other ramblings of his online on facebook he did share quite a bit the first to bring up here is an interview he did with 30 a figure making company when they started making ruby figures he told 30 that no matter what he was doing, creating something was the purpose. He would do it just to do it, to get it better and to keep moving forward in whatever way he could to discover himself. Animating, dancing, but never to stop. He also said that energy that persists beyond oneself is a lesson he would imbue Ruby with. And lastly from Facebook that I'm sharing in this video was a previs animation he'd kept in his back pocket for years at the time. Rough concepts choreographed to the tune of Korean boy band JTL. At the time, Monty lamented that he would never get to publish this because he'd thought he'd never get publishing rights to the song. But by the time he posted this, we'd already seen the animation. This is the final fight of Ruby Volume 1 at the docks, Blake and Son fighting Roman Torchwick. Aside from those, he also kept a deviant art journal, where he had plenty of entries. Reading them, sometimes you'll stumble upon quotes that made it into Ruby, or he'd reiterate just how busy he was with this or that, and when he was going to be at the PAX East Rooster Teeth panel where they'd revealed the first shots of Season 8, he shared a vague post about how big the con was going to be for him, and then he shared how excited he was that he'd actually already been working at Rooster Teeth for the past, like, 8 months. Either way, you can spend a whole day scrolling through those journals if you wanted. I recommend at least skimming them. A link is in the description for there as well. Thanks to the internet, there is still a wealth of information to remember Monty by. This video could be hours long, but I'm going to leave it here with some tweets of his, as well as one last thought that still gets me. Monty never knew the concept of Rooster Teeth animation. He died before Volume 3, before it began. Maybe there was a month or two of overlap, but even if so, that was nowhere near enough time to know just how many people have a job at Rooster Teeth, or just how many people watch what he created, or create content based on what he created, because this one man looked like he would be a great match 
for the needs of red versus blue. We love you, Monty, and thank you again.